you for joining us for today's service at Light Church, where we shine the word on the world. Well, good morning to the Light Church family and all of our many friends who are joining us as we get started today with our declaration. You know, I was thinking this past week, the Bible says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And that's why we get started every Sunday with a declaration. And so as we declare these things, I want you to join your faith as you declare these words so that they become a reality in your life. Let's get started. We gather in this place in Jesus name we come into your presence with singing and giving thanks. We come with confidence before the throne of grace. We find grace and receive mercy to help us today. We receive by faith our conscience purged by the blood of Jesus. We sanctify ourselves as vessels of honor and worship. We agree that Jesus, you are present with us and we welcome you in this place. We lift up our voices to you, Father, in one accord, for you are God. You made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You have spoken to us in these last days by your son, Jesus, the anointed one, whom you appointed heir of all things and through whom you made the universe. Show forth his resurrection and glorify him. Enable your servant to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Holy Spirit, come upon us. We submit ourselves to you. Anoint us, teach us, Talk to us, guide us into truth, and help us in our worship today. Glorify Jesus through us, for you are the power of God. We declare in this place, yokes of bondage are destroyed. Burdens are removed. The anointing of the Holy Spirit and power is present. We come against sickness, disease, dysfunction, disorder, depression, oppression of any kind, poverty, grief, confusion, weariness, unclean spirits, spirits of infirmity, pride, or deception in the name of Jesus. We cast you out right now. We declare the presence of the Lord in this place. Because of that presence, we speak rest, renewal, reviving, refreshing, restoration, reconciliation, and the remittance of sin in Jesus' name. We therefore bless the Lord with our whole heart. We praise you our creator, our redeemer, the most high God, the almighty God, the Lord God, Jehovah, hallelujah. Now, as much as we have declared those things, you act like they're so. So wherever you are, if you're still in the bed, this would be a good time for you to just slide out of bed right now, pajamas and all, and just raise your hands and just thank God for another day and another opportunity for him to use you. The power of the Holy Spirit is present right there where you are, and he is at work even right now. As we get ready to go into today's message, I challenge you to listen, and there ought to be at least one, two, maybe even three good points for you to take away so that you can start to implement them and see God operating not just in your life, but in the life of those that you touch this week. God's faithful, and so we've asked him to do so, 
and he always hears us when we pray and he grants us those things that we ask him for because we do so according to his will. So let's go into today's message. He's good all the time. Praise God. So let me just take this opportunity to welcome those who are joining us uh, via social media, the Light Church family and the friends of Light Church. And I want to take the opportunity this morning uh, to say I thank God for your faithfulness to him. One of the reasons why I say it that way is because I've, you've heard me say it before. I, I don't believe it's proper for me to thank you for being good to God. It just something's not right about that. But I can thank God for you being faithful. All right. But for me to say thank you all for being faithful to God. No, that's what we should be. All right. And so when Jesus talked about faith, you remember in one lesson, he says, you know, which of you having a servant that you give instructions to go out and to do something? And that servant comes back having accomplished it. He says, do you thank that servant? I think not, because that servant just did what he was supposed to do. So tithing and offering and serving, that's just what we are supposed to do. All right. And so I thank God for his faithfulness to honor the word that he gave us, that if you pray and pray according to his instructions, then we'll never run short. So when it comes to serving, for example, Jesus said the harvest is huge. There are more souls out there to be saved than we have ever thought of bringing in. But he said the answer to the shortage of help is to ask the Lord of the harvest. And so every day I ask God for help so that we can bring in the harvest that the scripture says God has been waiting for for a long time. And so he brings in the kind of help that we need. Amen. Amen. And so if you're short on help, Jesus gave you the answer to that. He said, ask the Lord of the harvest for help and God would certainly supply. And he has constantly supplied us with the help that we need. All right. One of the things that I realize is when it comes to what God sends us because of how he created us. He created us to be developers. He created us to cultivate. And so you remember Genesis chapter two, the Bible says he put the man in the garden to cultivate it. Everything that he needed was in that garden. But he still needed to go in and to develop and to cultivate it. And so a lot of times the help that God sends us is in our lives. But if we don't cultivate it, if we don't develop it, then we don't realize the potential of that help. And they go somewhere else and, you know, over there, they're developed. And, you know, we look at them and wonder, well, why didn't you do that when you was in my life? <laughs> well... <laughs> Well, how much cultivating time did you spend? How much investment did you make in developing them? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, we are uh, not in the middle, but at the beginning of our relationship series. And we're talking about uh, godly relationships. Every time I do these series, and I've done them now for quite a while, uh, at least every year or every year and a half because it's such an important piece to our lives as Christians because we're not saved to live alone. Okay, we're not saved to live on an island or to be isolated from others. And that's even giving into account the or taking into account how we are made up because we all made up differently. We have different personalities, okay? And so, you know, there are some people that are what we might call introvert. They, they're not a social butterfly, so to speak. 
And then there are some people that are extroverts. And they, I mean, man, you know, they just, they just out there. All right. But no matter how you are made up, you're still not created to live alone. And so relationships are more important than we really give them credit for. Now, we can be prideful and boast about we don't need nobody. But as they used to say when they would correct us, that's a lie and the devil ain't in it. I mean, God ain't in it. That's what it was. That's a lie, and God ain't in it. The devil is all up in there trying to, trying to convince you you don't need nobody. All right, you just, you're talking to somebody, hoping somebody is there, even if it's just you. And somebody knock on your door and hear you talking, and ain't nobody in there. They want to know, okay, who were you talking to? All right, so we are, we are created to, to live socially and so as we look at principles from the word of god it's all it's amazing to me how we overlook some of the simplest things and because we overlook them our lives are not exactly as they should be simple things that we take for granted. A lot of times we overlook them because of pride. Uh, A lot of times we overlook them simply because of rebellion. Um, What I have discovered is that we don't generally overlook things because of ignorance. All right. In fact, if you're ignorant of it, you couldn't have overlooked it. That makes sense, right? You you couldn't overlook it if you were ignorant of it. All right. So you have to be aware in order to to overlook it. Amen. Father, we thank you for the word today as we continue to grow up in you and all things. We expect the word to go forth and we expect you to confirm it with accompanying signs and wonders. For only when your word goes forth and your word is preached and taught can we expect miracles, can we expect healings, can we expect salvation, can we expect deliverance. For the truth of your word, Jesus said, is what makes us free. So I'm believing today that liberty will come, freedom will come as a result of your truth in Jesus name amen Amen. today's title is simple I'm calling it relationships what have you learned relationships what have you learned Matthew chapter 11 verses 28 through 30 have proven so eye-opening for me Because, again, we often overlook the simplest truths that cause us problems. But the first time I read this, uh, I read it like most of the time we do when we read Scripture. It's, It's a Scripture. You read it and you keep going. And the more and more over the years I have reread it and prayed over it and allowed the Holy Spirit to give me insight into it, I see why there were uh, frustrations and failures in my own life uh, in a number of areas because I didn't really understand, nor did I take in all that Jesus said. And the result is that Uh, there were things that happened in my life uh, that were supposed to be part of God's blessing. It should have been a blessing. Uh, The Bible says he's given us richly all things to enjoy. 
And I wasn't enjoying a lot of the things that he was blessing me with. But it wasn't his fault. I had overlooked this simple truth. So in verse 28 of Matthew chapter 11, we read these words. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you. Everybody say teach you. All right, because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. Now, hold up. If your soul is not at rest. If your soul is not at rest. Well, what does that look like when when our souls are not at rest? Help me. What would that look like? Anxious, worried, anxiety, losing sleep, depression. Come on, y'all getting to it. Y'all ain't got to it yet. Huh? Division, confusion, agitated. That's a good way of saying it. But what's the real word? Angry. That's that's a nice way of saying it. But what's the real word? Ticked off. All right. I mean, you mad. All right. That doesn't sound like rest. All right. But Jesus says you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. Now, he didn't say, so make sure you settle it. He didn't say, if you came to me, you wouldn't have a yoke. And a yoke is symbolic of work. Okay, so it's not, it's not effortless when you come to Christ. Okay, he's not telling you you won't have to do nothing. Just, you know, as they say, let go and let God. No, he ain't told you to let go of nothing except your former life. All right, put off and put on. All right, so he ain't told you you that you didn't have to do anything. So, So he says his yoke is easy. The word easy is relative because it has to be compared to something. And to this group, the comparison is made to what Jesus would require of them as opposed to what their religious system and religious leaders were requiring of them. Okay, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they had laid a difficult yoke on the people to try and satisfy and please God with this strict religious system that nobody could bear up under. And so Jesus says, I got a yoke. And compared to what you've been struggling with, mine is easy. Amen. Then he says, I also have a load for you to carry. Okay. The burden I give you, burden is something, of course, that you carry. So he's not telling you that you don't, you don't have to carry anything. Okay. So, so, so you know, uh, often we confuse some of the language that we as believers have used in the past. We confuse people because when people try and interpret what we say to them and it doesn't work out, then they get the impression that either we don't know what we're talking about, that God lied, or this stuff just doesn't work. All right, so when you you tell a person, if you take one step, you know, you know, the Lord will take, he'll take two. Well, okay, so what does that mean? So that's open for a person's discretion. All right, we, we have a lot of those sayings that a lot of times we know what it means, but to the person we're trying to communicate to, 
it's confusing and it can leave a lot left to ambiguity. In other words, huh? Okay. Um, uh, another one is, uh, you know, what he did for me, he'll do it for you. Well, wait a minute. What if I don't want <laughs> what, you, what you want? I don't want him to do for me what he did for you because I'm different from you. You follow what I'm saying? And, and again, as believers, we understand what we mean. But trying to interpret that as a believer or a new believer can be difficult. Because we go out looking for God. Well, they got a new car, so he's going to bless me with a new car. I don't mean that. Okay, you don't even have a driver's license. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> All right, you, can't, you, you don't have money to buy insurance and all that stuff. You follow what I'm saying? So I'm saying this all to say that the burden that he gives us is the load of responsibilities that he expects us to accept. All right. And compared to the load that was placed on these people by their religious leaders, the burden Jesus gives is light. You got it? Uh, it, it almost sounds comical, but it's true because you and I both know for I know those who have grown up in church, you know, that depending on what church you belong to, your load was heavy. You follow what I'm saying? I mean, man, you know, some of us, you know, we had to go to church at nine. Then there was the 11 o'clock service. Then there was the three o'clock service. And then there was the. That's right. There's a six o'clock BTU and then the seven thirty evening service. Then Monday night, that was the mission night. Tuesday night, that's choir rehearsal. Wednesday night, that's prayer meeting and teachers meeting. Thursday was the missionary society. Friday we was off, but the kids' activities was on Saturdays. And then Sunday rolled around, and we come back all over again. Amen. Now, for a lot of us, you know, we didn't consider it heavy. That's just what you did. That's why sometimes it's difficult for me to understand how less in terms of church stuff is asked and expected of people and yet they act like we're putting more on them. You know, because, I mean, for example, the agenda of this church only says we're here how many times a week? Yeah, well, it's just once now. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it used to be what? Wednesday night and Sunday. That's it. So how, you know, you consider that too heavy a load in comparison to what you do for everything else that you are part of is a, is a little puzzling to me. Because your social clubs, your sororities, your fraternities, all right, your friends groups always have something going on. They always require you to give an offering. You know, they always want dues and, you know, this event's coming up and you always got to buy clothes. Isn't that interesting how we're so willing to buy new outfits to go to a social event but then when we come to God's house, we don't want nobody telling us that we're inappropriately dressed. Wow. 
All right, so obviously I'm not going to finish this message up today. But I do want to give you some highlights to think about. All right, first of all, don't ever forget good relationships slash godly relationships. Because God is good, so good comes from God. Good relationships were God's idea. I know that sounds really simple, but it's just true. No man or woman came up with the idea of having a relationship. It was God's idea. We'll look at that. Number two, you have to understand that, and that's why we are at Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. Good relationships require learning. They require learning. You know, you don't just get born and then fall out of bed and you know how to relate. You know, when you get born, you don't even know how to talk. You have to be taught how to speak. What would make us think that we don't have to learn how to relate, how to have good relationships? Number three, Good relationships require good information. Yeah. So let's look at this for a moment. Good relationships were God's idea. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. Now, we're talking about relationships, and I have not really zeroed in on just male-female relationships. And the reason is, not because it's not important, but because I think it's, it's significant that we accept first the fact that relationships on any level were God's idea. Mother and father, did man come up with that? Well, certainly not. Okay, we can read it in Genesis chapter 2 where it says that a man shall leave his father and mother. That didn't come out of man's mouth. That came from God. Okay, when you look at pupil and teacher relationships, did man come up with the idea, okay, you're going to be the pupil, you're going to be the teacher. No. That's what God established in the parent-child relationship first. Because he said parents should teach their children. All right, so the male-female relationship, you know, the husband and wife relationship, it's important. But all relationships on whatever level were originated in God. And so because he is the originator, you would think on a logical level, it would just be wisdom to find out from him how this is supposed to work. That just sounds too logical because that's not what we do. We don't consult God on how these relationships are supposed to work. We think that we already know. And the result is disaster after disaster after disaster. Think about it. Disaster at the first level, the husband and wife. And if there's disaster at that level, what's the next level? There you go. Then the child gets to be part of the disaster. And on and on and on, because when the child grows up, then they have disastrous relationships with people that they have to work with. Why? Because of the disaster that started at home. All right. He, he saw the wreck that happened in the room next to where they lived. And so because of that, 
a disaster took place in that child's thinking. So now he thinks all women ought to be treated this way. She thinks all men ought to be treated that way. And so it don't make no difference whether it's the pastor or whether it's the pupil. If it's a male, this is who they are. If it's a female, this is who they are. It started at the first level of relationships that God established. Because we don't think that we ought to consult him. That we know how these things are supposed to work. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 11 says, But among the Lord's people, women are not independent of men, and men are not independent of women. Now that ought to put one lie to rest. I don't need nobody. Where did you hear that from? That don't sound like it came from the originator. All right, sound like a twist that came from the deceiver who started the trouble. When he twisted what God said originally to the woman and the man. Verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 11. For although the first woman came from man... Slow your roll, ladies. <laughs> Told y'all. Told y'all, y'all need us. Wait a minute. He's not through. Every other man was born from a woman. Does that settle it? So you can't have one without the other. <laughs> All right. Now, listen to how he summarize it because I told you last week relationships should go through God not exclude him you got it I don't care if it is your friend that relationship ought to go through God not exclude God just because y'all are friends he concludes this 12th verse by saying and everything comes from God. Amen. 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 So what can we learn just at the very outset of this? Well, we know God created us to be social. I tell you, we weren't created to live alone. We weren't created to be isolated. In fact, the very first time aloneness is identified in the scripture. God used two words that ought to summarize it for us. Not good. Amen. Not good. All right. We were created to live sociably with others. That's how he created us. And he proved it because he gave them the capacity to multiply. Amen. And in multiplying, they were to replenish the earth. So we were created to live amongst not just one or two, but a whole world full of people. Amen. Amen. Now, a lot of times, and I know for me, uh, it, it was uh, somewhat frustrating. But again, I thought, OK, I knew. So I didn't go to him to ask for answers because I just thought there are some people, you know how it is, fellas. Some guys could just rap. Y'all yeah. <laughs> know what rap mean? They know how to talk to a lady. All right. So they could just go up and I mean, you know, they just they man, they had the lines. You know what my best line was. I told you all that before. It was the same. Do you have some gum? <laughs> that was it. And and if she said no, well, that was pretty much the extent <laughs> of our initial communication. Some guys just had that man. They just had that wit. You know, they could drop lines, man, and it's like, you know, I don't care how she came back. 
to try and put him down or to try and cut him off. That brother just kept firing. He just had that gift. Man, I never had that. You know, first time I heard this line, you know, I know your feet got to be tired. Y'all heard that one? Yeah, because you've been. Yeah, and I heard legs at one time. Your legs, got, but I've, I've heard it both ways, but it's the same thing. I thought, man, that's great. That ought to be in scripture. That's a great line. I didn't know how to do that. But you know what I discovered? Everyone that did had to learn it. See, it's not that you aren't social. It's just that you don't know some things. But, but I don't want to get ahead of myself, but, but I can tell you that ignorance is an easy fix. Relationships must be learned. Jesus says in the 29th verse of this 11th chapter of Matthew, take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Proverbs 10, 21, fools die for lack of wisdom. You've heard Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed. Why? Because they don't have ability? No. Because of the lack of knowledge. All right. I, uh, one of my favorite verses says that if the ax is dull, you got to apply more pressure. You know what that means? That if you don't get smarter, that's what, mean, what it means to sharpen your axe. If you don't get smarter and grow in your wisdom, then you don't have to work harder. All right. So the, the issue is not that you're ignorant. We all are. Again, we don't come into this world automatically knowing so we have to learn and we learn as we grow and the person that stops learning is the person that discovers how hard and how frustrating and how difficult a challenge relationships can be so with Jesus listen to what he says come to me that's an invitation so I am to understand he's not going to force me to come. All right. This is an invitation to all who have found themselves troubled in their souls. If you want to remedy that, that here is an invitation that he gives you. But he's not going to force you to come. All right. So, so ignorance is our problem and has been. But again, ignorance is an easy fix. All right, it's, no pro it's, it's not a sin not to know. The problem comes when you know you don't know. And you refuse to learn better. So you just do what? You keep doing the same thing and it keeps coming out the same way and because you refuse to learn better, you resort to, you know what we do, it's their fault. It's not that I needed to learn how to communicate better. It's their fault because they always take what I say We have an invitation from Jesus to learn. And his way of learning is also here. Take my yoke. 
So with Jesus, it's not just lecture. There were times when he lectured. There were times when they sat at his feet. Okay, times when he gave them examples. This is how you ought to treat one another. So what did he do? He pulled off his clothes and got a basin of water and made them sit down while he washed their feet. And then when he told them in the kingdom, this is what leadership looks like. And when he finished that lesson, he got up and he said, now I have given you an example. So Jesus' method of educating and teaching did not just include a lecture. It included, number one, him doing it, giving us an example, but also him telling us, now you go do it. So when it comes to relationships, okay, there's the, there's the theory part of the word. In other words, what does the word tell me about this and this and this? And what does the word say I'm to do relative to this? What, is, what, what are my instructions? That's first. And then secondly, let me see an example of how that looks. All right. And he's left us plenty of good examples. All right. Well, another reason why we get all messed up, even when we call ourselves learning, is because we think it's our responsibility that we're good enough to pick the teachers. Now, you don't know, but you're going to pick a teacher that say, well, I'm gonna, I'll listen to them. And you know as well as I know that our criteria for selecting is all jacked up. Why? Because we're ignorant. Again, there comes a problem. We pick it on the basis of who we like, on the basis of, we, uh, you know, are they, are they friendly? You know, are we close to them? You know, are they our relatives? All that kind of messed up stuff. And if you read the word, you know God don't make, he don't make selections on that basis. Remember when they were trying to select the king? And even the prophet himself said, this got to be the one for king. He's tall, handsome, strapping young man. And God told him, cut all that out. I don't choose nobody based on how they look. Y'all look on the outward appearance. I'm looking at the heart. And so when it comes to selecting relationship teachers, it's the same principle. God's not trying to set you up with somebody that's going to always make you feel good and tell you what you want to hear and point out she right and you wrong and vice versa. He's not trying to do it on that basis. He's got one thing in mind, and that is what Jesus says, making you a disciple of his. And that should be lived out even in the course of the relationship. And if you are not becoming a disciple of Jesus in your relationships, then you got the wrong teacher. What can I tell you? There are ways that we are instructed to handle the issues that we have to deal with. Jesus had to deal with soulish issues. He had to deal with physical issues. He said, but he never was sick. Well, you don't have to be sick to know that it hurt when they throw a rock and hit you. <laughs> you, you follow what I'm saying? <laughs> All right. Sometimes sometime I might would rather take the cold than a brick. <laughs> All right. Several times he got stoned. All right. Beaten. So I'm saying to you that he had to deal with the same issues that we have to deal with because the book of Hebrews says he was tempted in every way that we are tempted with. All right. So, you know, it's like, well, you know, Jesus wasn't married. So what can he tell me about being married? Hey, you don't have to be married 
for somebody to point out to you the way you treat other people is jacked up. And I don't care if that's your husband or that's your wife. They're still brothers and sisters in the Lord that you are required to treat a certain way. You don't get the past just because, well, that's my husband. So it's okay for you to mistreat him. Now, in fact, the book of Hebrews, uh, book of Ephesians says, do good to those who are of the household of faith. That's, I think that's Ephesians. Especially, now he said, do good to all men, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Amen. Amen. I'm still talking about relationships. All right. And so and so the issue is we haven't learned better because we think we know. And when we think we know, then we're less likely to try and go get information that's going to help us. All right. But the Bible says even Jesus had to learn some things. Didn't it tell us that he learned obedience? Through the things he suffered. He sat at the feet of the teachers asking them questions at a young age. And we think that we don't need anybody to instruct us when it comes to something as important as relationships. That we have all the answers. See, this this idea of trial and error is what produces so many disasters. All right, and you can, you, can, you can go through life maimed and injured because of a disaster that could have been avoided if you had done what Jesus said, come to me, let me teach you. All right, so I, I don't have to go through life with a scarred heart or with scarred emotions. All right, I don't have to go through life shut up in my soul so that I'm not expressing what God put in me to express to other people. I'm not expressing that because of a disaster that blew out my emotions. I don't have to do that because I can come to him and I can learn from him. So he says, I'm humble. Well, that means then I got to learn humility. I got to learn that. Hey, wait a minute. This look, put it on me. It's on me. I, you know, hey, I, I probably said that wrong. In fact, I'm sure I did it. But just bear with me. I'm learning better. He says, I'm meek. I'm gentle. So I'm not going to rough you up while I'm growing. My Lord. All right, every, every, every fight don't require a knockout. <laughs> Follow what I'm saying? See, a, a good fighter knows when to duck. You know, he ain't just going in trying to knock your head off. He wait and see, okay, now, okay, now maybe I, I need a punch right here. But you learn those things when you let Jesus teach you because Jesus knew when to escape and he knew when to throw a punch. Amen. Don't you, don't you know that the disciples, man, it messed them up. They thought they knew how to deal with people that didn't treat them right. They thought they knew. And so when they were confronted where people say, we don't want to hear that, man, y'all, man, y'all don't know what y'all talking about. Then their response was, let's call fire down on them. <laughs> Jesus said, what's wrong with you guys? I didn't come here to burn people up. I came to save people. Just because they ain't sitting and listening to your message, you want, to, you want them to go to hell. Don't that sound like us preachers? If you'd have been in church, <laughs> you wouldn't have had that wreck. Oh, so now God's out wrecking folks' cars just because they won't come hear the message that you preach. 
But that's what happens when we remain in our ignorance in how we relate to one another. Amen. So I think I'll stop there and we'll take it up there next week. But understand that relationships are mandatory for us to carry out God's plan and his assignment to us. We're not supposed to do it alone. And he demonstrated that in the garden. And you stop and think about it. God could have fixed it where Adam could have just done it himself. I mean, he's God, isn't he? All right, but he didn't. And it was out of his own mouth that said, nope, alone, not good. When Jesus came, Jesus being the matchless son of God, man anointed mightily, according to the scripture, with an unlimited measure of the power of God. Amen. Couldn't he have accomplished his assignment without having to recruit the knuckleheads he had to train? <laughs> right? I mean, all he had to do was speak. I mean, if he could speak and make the wind obey and make the sea obey, all they had to do was speak. They came to arrest him. And all he said was, I am. And they passed out. So he could have, God could have fixed it where Jesus didn't need anybody, but that wasn't the plan. That wasn't the plan. And so from Genesis, the beginning, we see that God intends for us to have great relationships, good, godly relationships. Amen. And then Jesus comes along and we see that reinforced all over again, because now there's not just Jesus, there's the church. Yeah. That's right. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So we're not supposed to do this alone. Father, we thank you today for insight, for revelation into your word concerning relationships. We accept as truth that you are the originator of all relationships. And the invitation that Jesus extends for all to come and to be taught by him we thank you, Lord God. Many of us have answered that call. And often we've been absent from class and we've tuned out the lessons so that we sometimes find ourselves at a disadvantage because of our ignorance. We thank you for your long suffering and your patience with us. You really are the God of mercy the God of all grace, and we thank you for that today. I pray, Father, for those listening, for those hearing, for those who have not accepted the invitation to come. I pray that uh, what they have heard and are hearing would encourage them to make that decision so that as they join us in our learning. Our relationships glorify you and present you the way you deserve to be presented. You said in your word that you created all of us, no matter what hue, no matter what gender, you created all of us and your love for us all moved you to give your only son for our redemption. So let it be today, Lord God, whether there be one or a thousand or thousands, they hear the voice of the shepherd inviting them to come and to learn. In Jesus' name. For those of you who are viewing, 
there should be a number on your screen. I, would, I want to encourage you, if you need to make a phone call for somebody to connect to since you made that decision, don't hesitate to call us. We would really be excited to pray with you as you join us in learning of him. You need Jesus because he's the one that God sent with the lesson plans. He's the one that God sent to represent him as he had never been represented before. He demonstrates God's love for us all. Whether you consider yourself a good person or you consider yourself a bad person, Jesus demonstrated God's love for all. And so he wants you. And so he, inv he invites you to come. We thank God for that opportunity. We give God praise for his faithfulness to long suffer with us as we continue to learn. Relationships, what have you learned? Amen. Well, good morning to the Light Church family and all of our many friends who are joining Thank you us. for joining us in today's worship experience. It's time to honor God with our tithes and offering. As we give, we declare God's word over our finances and expect it to do just what he said. Let's confess. I confess this day unto the Lord God that we have come into the inheritance which the Lord swore to give us. We are in the land which you have provided for us in Jesus Christ, the kingdom of Almighty God. We were sinners serving Satan, but we called upon the name of Jesus, and you heard our cry and delivered us from the control of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of your dear Son. Jesus, as our Lord and High Priest, we bring the first fruits of our income to you and worship the Lord our God with it. We rejoice in all the good which you have given to us and our household. We declare that we live under an open heaven and that the windows of heaven are open to us. There is being poured into our lives blessings and overflowing proportions. That which destroys our income is rebuked for us by the Lord our God and the work of our hands is blessed. We are respected and highly favored of the Lord we have heard the voice of the Lord our God and have done according to all that he has commanded us. Now, Father, look down from your holy habitation from heaven and bless us as you said in your word. The journey of life is often unpredictable, and it is important to know your purpose in it. Receive Jesus today and learn about his plan for you. He is eagerly waiting to be a part of your life. The first step is salvation. Read Romans 10 and 9 and repeat this prayer. God in heaven, I believe in my heart that Jesus died on the cross for me and that you raised him from the dead. Jesus, I call on you now as my Lord and Savior. Please forgive me of all my sins. I will trust and follow you for the rest of my life. Amen. We look forward to you joining us for our next broadcast. Have a blessed week.